Good afternoon. So wonderful to see everybody. Just uh, for those of you who don't know, this is the first time we meet uh, in a sit-down event in a long, long time, over a year. I think all... I think all of us are suffering from social deprivation somehow, uh, and it's wonderful to see a full house here. Well, when I say full house, it's because we have to uh, abide by strict uh, Hong Kong government social distancing rules. Of course, we do that, and so we're delighted that all of you are here. Uh, I want to uh, first introduce uh, some of my former fellow trustees at the A Society. Uh, they are both uh, related to Hong Kong somehow, uh, but uh, some of them are now living, I don't know, wherever, uh, in Paris, in Shanghai, and so forth. So ladies and gentlemen, Duncan and Fritz. <laughs> Gucho also happened to be a global trustee of the Asia Society, so we're delighted. I thought that you guys like A Society so much that so many of you show up, but then once I got into this hall, I realized I, it was a mistaken uh, identity. Uh, you guys are here for good show, not for the A Society. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you are not a member yet, I suggest that on your way out, uh, you sign up, okay? This is the best deal in town. Uh, I remember uh, 20 years ago, then uh, Time Magazine voted Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong A Society as the best place to listen to a lecture in the whole of Asia. So, ladies and gentlemen, you guys are the smartest people in Asia, okay? Um, we are delighted that uh, Gucho can be here. Gucho and I are old friends. Uh, we all know he came, he came from uh, J.P. Morgan. He was a very, very senior banker there. He was head of Latin America and then head of Asia, Asia Pacific, which of course is a real growth area. And then he moved over to become the global head of uh, private banking, uh, the international private banking. Uh, and then to everybody's surprise, uh, he uh, decided to um, join the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Uh, let me say this, because I see quite a few Hong Kong friends here. A lot of people say, why have Gucho? And the answer is very simple. You know, 13 years ago, when Charles Lee became the chief, uh, chief executive of Hong Kong Stock Exchange, a lot of people were shocked. Why have a mainland Chinese guy? And I must say that the then chairman, Ronald McCulley, was very foresighted. Uh, that's why he's on my board, but anyway. Uh, and Ronald thought that Hong Kong's future is really the mainland of China. And hence, our client is going to be mostly mainland companies. And so he invited Charles uh, Lee, who also happened to be a JP uh, alumnus of yours, uh, to be the chief executive. And in those days, it was a time to build relationship between Hong Kong and the mainland as far as our financial and capital markets are concerned. And I think Charles did a good job. Uh, and so then after that, who, who's next? Well, unfortunately, U.S.-China relationship is a little bit uh, challenged right now. Uh, and uh, internationally, uh, we are coming under a little bit of a pressure. Uh, and so I say that today, as far as I'm concerned, just one, one citizen's view, Hong Kong's necessity to maintain as an international financial market is really not to forget the rest of the world. And we should never do so. And so I think that today is a time that we should redouble our effort in our international arena. And I really cannot think of a better person than Gucho to head uh, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange right now. When I first met him, I said, hmm, a Latin American, you know, Argentina and this and that. And uh, so I don't, I don't know quite what to think about him. Uh, but let me tell you something. Over the last eight years, the more I get to know Gucho, the more I realize this man has a lot of substance. Uh, he's a friendly guy, but don't let his friendly demeanor on the surface uh, uh, cheat you. Uh, he's a lot smarter than most of us, but certainly most, much smarter than me. So we are very, very happy that when we reopen this uh, uh, hall for a sit-down event, the first speaker should be Gucho. And I should also mention that uh, since assuming the position of the Chief Executive of Hong Kong Charlie Change, this is the first public event that Gu Cho is speaking, and we are very, very honored that you have chosen the Asia Society Hong Kong Center. Thank you, Gu Cho. Uh, lastly, before I invite him up, is uh, we have some students here, I found out. Uh, as you know, young people uh, attract young people, and they attracted my attention because I'm young. So, um, 
I spotted them, I asked them, and they came from London. Uh, many of you, them are from uh, what University College London, from Bristol, and so forth, doing internship in Hong Kong. And I told them that we have a house rule here, and that is, if somebody raised their hand to ask a question, and many of you are you know, a member of ours, you have to pay a lot of whatever, uh, and some of you are a supporter of ours, uh, but students don't pay anything. And when we have major events, by the way, we always invite them to eat free uh, and listen to world-class people. And that's what Asia Society under my chairmanship over the last 20 some years have made it a rule. Another rule I've set up is that if a student raised their hand together with another older folk who pay a lot of money to be here, who go first? Yes. Students go first. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, the reason is because they ask the toughest question. I want to make my speaker squeal. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Gucho Agusin. Great to have you, Gucho. Well, let me explain. Uh, his name is Nicholas. But uh, okay. his, uh, he go by Gucho, and uh, that is a, a name that we all have, uh, has become beloved to many of us, his friends. So if you don't mind, I'll call him Gucho. Don't think that I call him the wrong guy. That's, yeah. that's him, okay? <laughs> uh, the first question I want to uh, raise is the following, Gucho. I know you as a banker. I've seen you with uh, Jamie Dimon and Mary Erdos, you know, all these senior guys at, at, at J.P. Morgan. They respect you. They like you a lot. And you, I don't know how much you would pay, but I assume a lot. <laughs> Why the hell do you want to leave a very thriving banking uh, career with high pay and join a Hong Kong Stock Exchange? It's almost, almost like, a, 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 not quite a civil servant, but whatever it is, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's not going to be half as well paid as before. What motivated you to do that, Gucho? Tell us the truth. I don't right. see Innes here, okay. so I, I, you can tell us the truth. So Innes is just lovely I thought the white. students was, were the ones that are making people sweat. I mean, <laughs> um, but first, Ronnie, thank you for the intro. And, and, and I fully agree with Ronnie about the value of Asia society. And um, I've been a member for, for a long time. And, and, and especially Asia society Hong Kong. It's, it, it does a great job in terms of fostering understanding between East and, and West. And so, so the role uh, that Asia society plays, anyone that has any interest in making sure that there's more dialogue between East and West and understanding, this is the place to be. So um, thank you for all your work, Ronnie. I mean, it's, it's fabulous and, and, and I encourage everyone to sign up. So going back to, to the question, I mean, yeah. they, they, there are a, f a few, reasons why this makes um, a lot of sense for me. The first one is, I mean, I love Hong Kong. I mean, staying in Hong Kong is great and, 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 and being here. So, so, so that's an easy one, but- It's helpful but, that his wife, Ines, also loves right, Hong Kong. Right, right, right. But, but, there's, but there's a lot of things uh, behind this. I mean, and, and I, I'll mention just a few things and, and the thought process that I had when, when, when this opportunity was first discussed with me, the exchange is, is a thriving company. It's, a, it's, it's a, about 650 billion Hong Kong in terms of market cap, over 80 billion US dollars. Um, I mean, it's, it's a very large company, thriving, very profitable, and, and, and generating a lot of um, value every day. So, I mean, clearly, I mean, being there and being CEO of a publicly traded company of that size and everything was like exciting. And plus they pay me. It's not like I do it for free. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so, um, secondly, it's uh, the fact that I, I do believe um, that anyone that has an interest in finance, has to appreciate this opportunity. I've, I've always been involved in finance. I was at JP Morgan for 31 years. I, I studied in a very finance-oriented school. I was at the University of Pennsylvania, the Warden School. So, so all my life, you know, around finance. And, and my view is that the next 10 years, we're going to see what I call the big bang of finance. What does that mean? that if I look at the capital markets today in China, they're about 25 trillion US dollars, um, depending what types of things do you include, but roughly 25. And if I look at what they can be in 10 years, 
they can be well in excess of 100 trillion US dollars. And that is all going to happen over the next 10 years. And this is the biggest value creation or movement of money that humanity will have ever seen. And it won't be repeated again because it's the moment when international investors are starting to go into China and then this gigantic domestic saving platform from China is starting to move outside. So even if you project the current slow pace of opening up, even at that pace, it's going to be massive and the biggest thing ever seen. So to have the opportunity to be in the middle of this financial big bang, and, and it's not only being in the middle, I mean, it's actually being in the institution that channels a lot of like this flow between East and West. I mean, it's, it's just like an incredible opportunity for anyone that you know, has a passion and all their lives has been focused around finance. And then beyond that, of course, when, when you think about all these things, you also need to find some meaning and some purpose in, in everything that you do. And, and, and from my point of view, and just for the reason that I joined Asia Society, I want to make sure that there's continuous dialogue between East and West. I want to, to make sure that there's increased connectivity, that we continue, pu continue to push that. That this is great for everyone, great for humanity. The more that we have the societies tangled together, the less likely that there will be an issue, the more likely that we live in harmony. So I do believe that a lot of, you know, what the exchange does by putting together investors from all over the world with companies that are emerging, mostly from China, because a lot of the companies listed there are from China, I mean, creates a platform for stability for the long term. And besides that, <clears throat> um, I mean, and I, and I look at some of the recent listings that we've had and, 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 and we, all the biotech companies that we have listing there, we, um, in the last three years, we had about 70 healthcare companies listing in, in, in the exchange, about half of them, about 35, did not have any revenues. And in total, that sector raised about 400 billion Hong Kong dollars of capital. I mean, think about that. I mean, companies that are discovering new cures to a lot of like um, difficult uh, diseases. So you, you do feel that there's, there's a lot of things that you're doing um, for society, creating jobs, making sure that the economy continues moving forward. So I feel very good about all, all those factors. So I think it's like, you know, a, a very unique opportunity and, and I wouldn't waste it for anything in the world. Just digress a bit. Um, you mentioned about the biotech companies listed in Hong Kong. Your staff told me that Hong Kong is now the second largest? Yes, platform. second largest biotech to, who? to, who? Uh, to New York. New York, of course. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Second but, largest biotech capital raising uh, hub in the world. Did anybody know this before? Sorry for my ignorance. I didn't. Anyway, uh, where are the companies from that are listed? Is it all mainland it's, China? It's Hong mostly Kong? mainland. Yes, mostly mainland. mainland. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But uh, obviously, all the people, all the researchers, all the you know, publications, right. I mean, there's so much that comes from all over the world. And, and this is an issue that I, I have raised. 400 billion cha being channeled through Hong Kong. Now, what happens? And, and this is where the financial world meets real economy. When you have 400 billion, you start having, okay, we need a researcher. So you need a scientist. You need someone doing this. You need this, you need that. You need support. All these things start attracting people that come here that, that start you know, investigating and, and, and it creates tons of value over time. Very good. But okay, let me go back to my, what I wanted to say, origin, to ask originally. And that is, uh, let's begin with a little bit of a macro picture. Uh, the world is not exactly the most peaceful place right now. Uh, U.S.-China relationship is going from bad to worse, uh, and they have uh, been tough on China on many areas. Uh, the one area that I haven't seen them done a whole lot is really in the financial sector. Of obviously, they have a lot to lose as well. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of commitment of American companies in Hong Kong and this part of the world. So, do you 
do, does it worry you that whole U.S. China situation uh, in terms of the capital market in Hong Kong, the financial international financial center position of Hong Kong, uh, and will there be some delinking between China and the U.S. in terms of finance? I think it is one of the risks that I'm I'm obviously uh, focused on, and 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 that's why I think it's important to to do whatever I can to make sure that both sides continues, continue dialoguing. I mean, I, I, I think I'm, I'm okay as a banker, I'm okay as a manager, but the reality is that the credibility that uh, comes from Hong Kong, selecting someone that has a, a really an international experience. Most of my life I was in the US, I was educated in the US, my, my kids were born in the US. I mean, I, I have a lot of linkage to international businesses. Only in the last eight years, I came to Hong Kong. And by the way, when Jamie asked me to come to Hong Kong, I was like, why me? I mean, I mean- Jamie Diamond, uh, the chairman right. CEO of JP. So, um, and, 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 and it was a fabulous experience, but I am seeing this, um, uh, this divergence that's occurring. And, 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 and I don't intend to say, okay, I'm gonna stop it or anything. I mean, it, 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 the, the trend is very strong, but, I think it's important to, at a minimum, try to to slow it down, make sure that people speak, and 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 I intend to do whatever I can to make sure that you know both sides are are are, are speaking to each other at a at a minimum from the business sector, and and you know Ronnie that in fundamentally in the U.S. the corporate sector plays a huge role in policy making. I mean, it's not just Congress. I mean, it's it's this this interaction. And, and exactly in the way that you mentioned it, the more that uh, corporates feel that it's important for them to continue being here, continue doing well, the more that they will make sure that before any action is taken, that there's conversations about why, what's the benefit, how can we do it a different way? And, and, and so my, my intent is to try to help in that way. What's your vision about Hong Kong? Not just Hong Kong Stock Exchange, okay? But where do you see Hong Kong can be in five, 10 years time? Uh, obviously, financial service is the most important industry. I think many of us will agree on that. Uh, so how would, ha- what does Hong Kong have to do in order to, be, to continue to thrive as an international financial center? So um, I'll start with the end. I think the best years of Hong Kong are ahead of us. I talked about this big bang of finance that we, that will happen. I mean, people don't fully realize we are in the middle of that. We're really connecting East and West, and not only East and West, also if you look at Southeast Asia, everything that will happen with developing Southeast Asia, this is the connector. And then if you add to that, some other developments, such as Greater Bay Area, 70 to 80 million people, almost $2 trillion of GDP in this area. Some of the programs that are being discussed, Wealth Connect and and, and how to integrate the whole region. This is as big as France. This is not like 7 million people anymore. And then when, when we talk about areas like, for example, healthcare, biotech, second hub in the world, that will attract so many PhDs over time. And this is just beginning because when you have people, that creates vibrancy. The more vibrancy you have, the more others are attracted. And right now, as, as, as you mentioned, and when you asked me about like where does, do all these companies come, they're mostly from mainland, the companies. But wait until you start seeing some from Southeast Asia, from other parts of the world, because they can really raise the capital. And in addition to that, the fact that through some mechanism like Stock Connect, you have access to that mainland investor, which is very, very unique. That is like a powerful force. So you you look at all those huge advantages, long-term advantages, and you're doing all this in an environment where you have, you know, free flow of capital back and forth. So you can you know, come in and out of Hong Kong as many times as you want, buy, sell Hong Kong dollars as much as you want. You have a place that is like 
pretty much the renminbi capital of the world you 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 do you do this in a place where the rule of law is very consistent it's common law it's a law that people around the world understand the business community understands in a place that has an infrastructure that everyone is um you know has been built over years over decades to accommodate all this growth with a regulatory environment that is one of the best in the world praised all over the place you know this regular plus taxes are really cheap i mean it's like it's not know, i mean so too, too high i mean when, when when you put all these things together with a macro environment that is you know so attractive and um it's just like difficult to see how this is not going to go forward of course there are risks i am very very conscious of the risks and and that's why my my focus is to try to do whatever i can to try to limit any any damage well as we all know there are three major fundraising centers in the world they all by the way common law common law uh, places and new york london and hong kong mm -hmm. and just as america in the 20th century was by far the biggest a uh, supplier of capital. I th I believe the US will continue to be a big supply of supplier of capital, but the real new player in the field is China. And there's so crazy the amount of money. I feel so poor when I go into mainland China. <laughs> so 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 all that money ought to be channeled through Hong Kong. What can we do to make sure that those Chinese money will come here on the one hand, on the other hand, how do we make sure that they have enough products? Uh, to uh, invest in, be it the stock market, uh, structural products, and many other. By the way, uh, your staff did a great job. Uh, she told me beforehand that Hong, uh, that Hong Kong is what the, the biggest structural uh, product market yeah, in the world. Structural products market. In the Gosh. World. Yeah. Uh, so, so how do we make sure that the money keep coming on the one hand, and that the proper kind of products are being produced, and that the reputation of Hong Kong uh, will be maintained as a financial center? You know, sorry, I hate to mention names, but you know, there are certain places in Canada or. It's elsewhere in the world who are seen to be casinos, uh, commodity-related stock exchanges and so forth, and we want to avoid that. So how do we make sure the money keep coming, and how do you make sure that the products are, 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 are being produced in Hong Kong for, to absorb those money properly? Yeah, so we have to focus on the areas that are strategic advantages. So Hong Kong is the most Chinese international city outside the mainland. So, and, and it's the most international city of China. So when, when you think about that, it's a very unique position to be in. You can enjoy the benefits of being linked, you know, to China. We have like this mechanism that is Stock Connect, which is a very, very unique uh, mechanism. We have now Bond Connect and there's more being created, the Wealth, Wealth, Wealth Management Connect and things like that. And um, at, at the same time, it has access to all the investors from all over the world. So it will not happen overnight because China will not open up overnight. They have to pace it. They're moderating it. But we, since I arrived here that, you know, when I came to see you many, many years ago, I mean, every year there was something new. And when I think about my days at JP Morgan, I mean, the type of presence that a JP Morgan had in China versus the type of presence that JP Morgan has in China today, it's very different. It has expanded a lot. There's a lot, lot of additional things. JP Morgan now has a fully controlled asset manager in, in China. It has a fully controlled securities company, a fully controlled, uh, fully owned, um, uh, locally incorporated bank. All those things. So, so the progress is there. Of course, some people wanted progress quicker. They wanted it faster. I mean, China will do it, you know, at, at its pace. It's it's learning from the process. The markets are relatively new, and they just want to make sure that they minimize the risks in doing that. They want to make sure that they don't make mistakes. So, I it it, it won't be overnight, but the the, the the opportunity, as I mentioned, is there. And, and from a product point of view, we need to make sure that people continue being here. Do you see gaps in the Hong Kong financial market that you'd like to see filled? 
some people say asset management may be leaking a little bit, uh, the bond market trading and, and, and foreign exchange. And are, are there some gaps in the Hong Kong uh, mar uh, financial market that you think uh, you can help bring to Hong Kong to fill those gaps? Yes. Um, so when, when I look at our market, it's, it's a great cash market. Cash equities fundamentally there's so much more to do around the, the fixed income side. We've seen uh, the great development of Bond Connect that has been growing significantly. The derivatives market has a lot to grow. Today, uh, Singapore does a pretty good job in terms of like the derivatives market, but the opportunity to grow that market in Hong Kong, and recently we've entered into an agreement with MSCI to try to develop that. And we added um, around 14 different indices um, to, to, to our offerings. And that is just like um, very significant. Then on the commodity side, that's also an area that Hong Kong can develop quite a bit. Um, we, we have the London Metals Exchange and uh, we have um, QME, which is um, a, a, a commodities uh, company in China. Uh, we have a stake in Wanzhou Futures Exchange. I mean, through all these things, hopefully we can develop more and more the commodities market. And that's not, that's even before I started talking about things that could be important for the futures, like things that involve data, you know, selling potentially data, um, things around, or the, some of the megatrends, ESG. We, we're right next to the biggest emitter in the world, carbon emitter in the world. So, so in a way, the possibility of creating an exchange around um, climate-related uh, products is just gigantic. And uh, things like um, digital assets, for example, that's, you know, maybe interesting as well. I'm not, I'm not talking just Bitcoin. I'm talking about all sorts of digital assets. So um, th there's, there's a lot of uh, mega trends that um, will eventually develop in, in, in Hong Kong and, 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 and we have to make sure that we can pr prioritize some of those and, and, um, and, and take advantage of the opportunities as, as they come. So um, another area, private equity. We have so many great private equity firms based in Hong Kong. I mean, some of the best in the world in my view. Correct. So, I mean, I think there are many opportunities. Venture capital as well? Venture capital, yes. Yes, so there's great venture capitalists here. Can you say a word about the yeah. Greater Bay Area? Yeah. What, what does that mean to Hong Kong uh, as an international financial center? So Greater Bay Area essentially is, is the idea of connecting some areas in the south of China with Hong Kong and Macau, which, as I mentioned, it has, you know, Little, around 70 million people. So it, it, it becomes a quite a significant center and close to $2 trillion of GDP. So just to put it into perspective, that's around the size of France, a little bit smaller. And the idea is that a um, certain type of transactions will be, will be allowed to take place seamlessly. So if you're in Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Macau, Hong Kong, it's the same. It doesn't, there's no capital controls or anything. For that. That's, for example, Wealth Management Connect, which it's intending to attract a lot of wealth management um, investments in the region. Up to a certain amount, people are going to invest seamlessly between Hong Kong and China. So people in, you know, Shenzhen will be able to open an account in Hong Kong. People in Hong Kong can open an account in China or Macau or anywhere. So um, it, it is very, very significant. And when we start, start adding things like climate-related things, it could be very, very interesting. And, and I would expect that this is an area that we're going to hear more and more and more because it is one of the shortcomings of Hong Kong. It's only 7 million people, 7.5 million. So when you're talking that you'll have 70 to 80 million, it just changes the equation. This could be um, uh, a France, a Germany, just this part. And all those areas interacting together in technology, in, in science, we talked about biotech, fintech. I, there's so much to do. 
it could be, you know, a really significant, you know, center for a lot of um, sectors in, in the region. Well, outside of uh, China, uh, what can we do with Southeast Asia, the ASEAN countries, what can we do with India? Are there, do you see other things that, you know, Hong Kong people, Hong Kong Stock Exchange should tap into in order to benefit ourselves and strengthen our position as an international financial center? Yeah. So um, the Hong Kong Exchange is becoming the, the center on a few sectors. Some of those sectors are new economy. Just three, three years ago, the Hong Kong exchange had around 4% of its market capitalization be new economy companies. That is just like in 2018. <clears throat> now it's about close to 30%. So you can see the dramatic growth of new economy. So you have all these new economy companies listed here. Everyone knows that Companies want to be where their peers are. So that may attract some players from Southeast Asia, and we have some already that are starting to come, to say, I want to be next to my peers. We just talked about what, what's happening in biotech. That is another area that could be you know, a great way to try to centralize activity from, from many places around the world. And then it's... It's the biggest offshore RMB center in the world. So the more that RMB financing develops, this is a perfect place, you know, to be. So there, there, there are many areas that I think were like ripe um, uh, at this point uh, to start growing aggressively. Going forward, I'm sure we'll have more. Uh, you're absolutely correct that China is going to move in its own pace. It's not going to, uh, a lot of people say, you know, you should open up your capital account and this and that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that China will, may disappoint some people, but I think personally, I believe that in the long haul, it's probably good for China. But how do you see Hong Kong uh, in, re in this relationship to RMB or China? How, what will happen to the RMB in the next five, seven, ten years? Should Hong Kong uh, is really sensitive? I, should yeah. Hong Kong still be packed to the U.S. dollars mm -hmm. or what? Feel free not to answer. Yeah, okay? no, no, no. Because you so, have an important job. So um, I'll, 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 I'll talk about the RMB and and the outlook for the RMB. Um, since since I arrived here, the RMB has been at the in in when 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 I first came here, the movement of the RMB was very very controlled. Now it moves you know, up and down, and there's different channels that have been opened slowly to be able to get into China, to get out of China. So while it's not completely free today, um, the availability and the possibility of people investing in RMB assets has, have gone up a lot, similarly with people that want to finance in, in, in RMB. And um, so as, as we go forward, I, I would expect RMB to continue increasing its position as a, um, as a global currency. Now, I, don't, I, I wouldn't see it as a reserve currency of the world because of the restrictions that it has. And I, I wouldn't expect the restrictions to go away in the near term. I don't know if it's going to be 10 years, 20 years, or 15 years, or eight. I, I, I don't know, but it's not going to be in the next couple of years. Um, but if you look at any indicators, including the amount of transactions that are settled in RMB, or if you look at the amount of RMB being used, I saw in The Economist, um, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, it was just a chart indicating the amount of um, uh, RMB held as, as, as reserves by, by different countries. It's slowly going up. I mean, it's still like 2.5% or something along those lines. So it's being increasing, but, 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 but it still has, has a way to go. Just for your information, about 10, 12 years ago, we, at the, here at the Asia Society Hong Kong Center, we had a uh, gala dinner, uh, and Robert Mandel, the 1999 Nobel Laureate in Economics, was our speaker. And my last question to him on stage was the following. For how long do you think the U.S. dollar will remain as the sole international reserve currency? And his answer was, without thinking, 100 years. And... So a couple of years later. How long ago? 
How, how long ago was that? Uh, maybe, t- well, I don't know, I have to ask my check. <laughs> maybe 12, 15 years ago. So 88 to go, okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and so a few years later, he was in my home. So I asked him, I said, Bob, do you remember that? And he said, yes. And I asked him, I said, change your mind? Nope. Unfortunately, he passed away a couple of months ago. But anyway, uh, so the U.S. dollar may well be the only international reserve currency for a long time. But I think, but you do expect that the, U, the RMB will at least uh, will in trade, yeah. uh, in investment, right? And even uh, to some extent as a reserve currency more and more. I, I actually think that <clears throat> a combination of things will probably... Um, result in, in other currencies, including the renminbi, becoming more important around the world. And I'll, I'll just mention two. I mean, one, in, in certain ways, there is a bit of um, um, a concern around the usage of the dollar to kind of affect certain policy. And, and, and therefore, there, there's, there's concern around that. And, and, and people may think, wow, I mean, is this reliable? What am I, what can I do? And people will look for alternatives. That's the first one. The second one, which for someone that, you know, knows about inflation, you know, I'm from Argentina. So, I mean, it's like, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> I, I have a PhD in inflation since age five. So, um, so I, I am a little bit concerned about that. And, and, and you saw the, the indicators around uh, retail inflation in the US, 5.4% uh, year on year. That's, that's a big number. And producer prices was also very high. And uh, once you start um, affecting inflation expectations, it's a, it's a dangerous game. Of course, I mean, I, I think it's temporary. I mean, I don't think this is going to be like forever like this, but, but it may get worse. And inflation is the biggest tax on the poor people. And at a time when we have a lot of um, inequities and concern about um, the, um, the social inequality, um, it's, it's, it's an issue that it's, it's a bit dangerous in, in my view. And um, once I was in a meeting that I was invited with um, um, the governor of the Central Bank of Japan, Kuroda, and um, he was like saying that they were trying really hard to get to 2% inflation. And he thought like they'll get to one and a half maybe, but they'll try to get to 2%. And I said, you know, Governor Kuroda, one of the things that you can do is name an economy advisor from Argentina. And I, <laughs> trust me, it'll overshoot 2% without doing anything else. Okay, it will so not it's not that hard. I mean, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> so now the point is inflation expectations are very important. Once people start adjusting wages and, um, and, and, and my daughter is in the US now in, in Wyoming and, and, and it's really hard to get people to work right now and, and sh- be, there is I mean no one wants to go to work I mean because it's like they're receiving all these economic recovery payments and the economy is recovering so she is actually being offered like two or three jobs as doing waitressing for like $20 an hour so just to give you a sense of the pressure in terms of like a uh, hirings and, and she was like, uh, okay, but I can only work from two to six. And they were, okay, that's fine. Okay. I mean, so, so the, the reality is you're start, starting to see pressure on hirings and wages. And, and, and so it may be okay because there's, there's so much productivity that we're seeing in the economy as a result of technological improvements and, and, and other things that it may be fine, but, but it's also a risk. And, and so when, when I look at all this printing that's going on around the world, all this easing of monetary policy, I do have some concerns. You know, I come from Hong Kong. I grew up here. And in Hong Kong, we only, in our old days, even, well, even today, we only know one QE. That's QE2. <laughs> Queen, Elizabeth the, <laughs> Queen Elizabeth II. <laughs> And in the last couple of years, I have to learn about QE5, QE7, QE10. I mean, with all that money that is flowing into the system, it seems inevitable that one of these days inflation is going to hit us hard. I understand that China has been quietly absorbing a lot of money. So they were the 
the worst, by the way. It went all the way back to the Jiang Zemin days. They were already using printing money in order to, to keep the economy going. Uh, and then, of course, you have the 2008 uh, crisis, financial crisis, so they printed more. Uh, but I think that in the last 10 years, they've been, they, they are aware of it. They've been you know, pulling back. But the West is now committing the exact same sin as China did in the past. And I do worry that one of these days, uh, that inflation is going to really whack us yeah. really hard. Yeah. But let me, uh, before I open to the, uh, to the audience for a question, uh, let me just ask you one last question. And that is, you are now the exec chief executive of uh, Hong Kong China Exchange. What kind of reform do you think is necessary for Hong Kong? in terms of its listing rules, in terms of its market uh, policies and so forth. Are there some, uh, some reform that you really like to see Hong Kong happen in order to keep Hong Kong a thriving international financial service center? So, I mean, I actually think that the Hong Kong market is, is, is quite efficient. And that's why people decide to choose Hong Kong as a, as a center where they want to operate, to trade. So, so overall, it is um, an efficient center. Now, every day, we need to be, uh, we have to continue looking at areas where we can improve. And, and I'll, I'll just give you one example that happened last, last week or two weeks ago when we had that um, black storm, remember? I mean, it was Monday, my, my first storm at the exchange. So Monday morning, so they called me, oh, we have to like, we cannot like open. And I was like, w we're not opening? <laughs> and, <it's> like, <laughs> and I was like, okay, what's happening? And, and, and of course, now we're much more linked into a, lo a lot of other places. We're linked into China, we're linked into the rest of the world. People need to hedge, people need to do certain things. And we're coming out of COVID. So people were used to operating from home. So, I mean, the first question that I had was like, oh, should we leverage everything that we've learned to find a way to see how we can continue operating. Of course, I don't want to put anyone at risk in terms of like having to go to the office during um, you know, a typhoon or um, you know, black storm. But, but the reality is there, there, there must be a way where we can make sure that when people trade, the market is open. And um, so I was, you know, I mean, that, that's an example of, you know, one little thing that we need to, we could potentially work. And, and then there's a lot of microstructure um, uh, areas that, that, that we need to look at. I mean, I, 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 I fully understand um, the needs uh, for, for um, to have uh, revenues and things like that. At the same time, we have to make sure that the market is competitive globally. And so when, when we look at our, the stamp duty here, we, we have to make sure that we find ways to continue making the market competitive with all other places around the world. And, 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 and that is important. So, uh, and at the same time, recognizing the needs to make sure that we help the people around uh, the city. So, so we have to think about all these things and, and find a way to, to, to get to the ideal solution. Fine, open. Uh, one last question, sorry. Um, ESG. Yeah. You, meant, you, you touched upon it earlier, but without delving too much. Um, you know, uh, th that's a big thing. And uh, Asia in general maybe is a little bit behind that of Europe and the United States, but I think we're catching up really fast. But the problem is the, the standard is really vague, generous, ambiguous, uh, and, and, and whether you like it or not, the financial service really... Uh, is one way to push for standard setting and, and, and redefinition because everybody needs to borrow money, everybody needs to use the capital market, and if you guys demand companies to do this and that in order to be listed, right? So, uh, 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 so there's a lot of things that I think the, Hong Kong, the, the, the stock exchanges anywhere in the world uh, can do. Uh, is there any plans that the Hong Kong Stock Exchange that, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that it's you not, are doing in this yeah. regard? It's not only the, the Hong Kong exchange, because I mean, in this, we need to work together with a lot of stakeholders. So um, obviously the exchange loves operating in uniform products that can be compared and traded in a marketplace. So for us, it's very important to have that uniformity and for the whole of our society to be able to exchange 
whether it's carbon credits, goods, anything. I mean, we need to have uniformity. Now, this is not something that we can do by ourselves. We need, and we are working with HKMA, SFC, with the government itself, with international organizations. So there, there's a lot of work that's, that's being done, you know, behind the scenes to try to create this uniform view of different segments of ESG, whether it's climate, um, in, at the exchange itself, every day we're doing something new around like they need to have, for example, diversity in the board. We put uh, you know, certain consultations out right there around that uh, about having proper governance and making sure that you know, the boards have the right you know, membership and, 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 and what's considered an independent board member versus not. So there's, there's, there's a lot of areas um, that, that we're working on every day, but it takes time. This is not easy. And, and it's a real thing, by the way. And, and I, li I, I like it when I like it more, let's say, when it comes directly from the market, when investors start saying, I'm not going to invest in this type of company. I want a company that complies with this certain type of uh, requirements. And on that side, the, 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 the one area that we're pushing a bit, all the companies that list in the exchange to be very open and disclose in their financials what they're doing about ESG so that investors have a clarity on what they're investing in and they can decide this is a company that fits the criteria that I want to have in my portfolio or not. Sorry, I'm hopeless. Um, one more question. Uh, a lot of Chinese companies are still going to the United States to be listed. And uh, why not coming to Hong Kong? What can we do to, to attract them here? Uh, just a side story. I, you know, within a month of uh, Jack Ma listing Alibaba uh, in 2014, we, the Asia Society, I know Duncan, you may be there, Fritz. We 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 honored him at the United Nations building, and 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 that afternoon, I introduced him to Ban Ki Moon, the then Secretary General, and. As Jack and I were waiting for the elevator for uh, Ban Ki-moon to come up, uh, I said, Jack, I know why you left Hong Kong, because Hong Kong at that time do not allow right, uh, different shares in Hong Kong. So that's why you come here. You wanted to list in Hong Kong originally, but Uncle Sam's hand is very long. Yeah. And you know, one of these days, if there's an opportunity, I think you should come back. And obviously, as a Hong Kong person, I'm, I'm just trying to drum up business for you, Red Star Exchange, right? Uh, so that I can, they, you can pay more tax. I don't have to pay as much. But anyway, uh, and I think that Jack thought I was crazy. He would never imagine that the situation can get as bad as it did. And so eventually, what, two years ago, Alibaba is now, you wrote, did you write the book on Alibaba, on Jack? You're one of them, yeah, right. Anyway, so they came back to Hong Kong and, and to, be, uh, uh, to be also listed here. Uh, so why are so many companies still listing there? I know it's a lot easier, more more relaxed, and uh, you know, uh, PE may be higher and this and that. No, what can uh, we it's do? not higher, by the way. Huh? It's not. It's not. It's not higher. I it's mean, not? it may have been at some point okay. higher. I mean, right now it's not. But but there's there's I mean there's benefits. Or, or, or strengths and weaknesses of every market. And um, the, for example, there are some companies that will not qualify under Hong Kong. That under, and, and you mentioned Alibaba. At that point, Ali, Alibaba, because they had weighted voting rights, they wouldn't qualify. Now they qualify. I mean, so um, there are some companies that don't get to certain thresholds. There are some companies that don't have all their papers in order. And the system in the US is different. The system in, in the US is a system of disclosure. There's, because, I mean, there's class action lawsuits under, you know, many circumstances. So essentially, someone goes there, you don't need to prove that you've done everything right. If you have a problem, they can sue you later on. So, I mean, that's why a lot of the companies have lots of lawsuits. I mean, while in Hong Kong, there's no class action lawsuit. If anyone suffered a loss, they can claim it. But you, you don't have like a lawyer that will say, I represent everyone else. And just like sues, you know, a company. And for a in that context, you need to have more due diligence. It's more stringent, and and it takes time. And some some companies say, I don't want to take the time. And yes, maybe I'll have to deal with the class action lawsuits in in the future. But in any case, I think there will always be a market for companies in the U.S. There'll be a market for companies. In Hong Kong, there'll be a market for companies in Shanghai. There'll be a market for companies in Shenzhen. And and I don't want 
Shenzhen or Shanghai not to do anything and I get all the business or anything like that, the better that Shanghai does, the better that we'll do. The better Shenzhen does, the better we'll do. So what we can do is make sure that we work together to create you know, this vibrancy in the market. If we create vibrancy, everyone will benefit. I don't want, we can learn a lot from America, but I hope that we don't learn from America this one thing. <laughs> so you're not going to change that, right? Uh, okay, good show. Uh, okay, uh, open to the public. Anybody uh, want to ask a question? The gentleman at the very back. Hi, guys. Um, thank you so much for your sharing so far. Uh, my name is Pradyut. Um, I'm a student here at HQ. I think my question mainly revolves around the fact to shift the focus back into Hong Kong and not think of it as a gateway for one second between Hong Kong and China or Hong Kong connecting the East and the West. And, and I think I want to get a better sense of your thoughts around stimulating growth from within. So for example, touching themes like entrepreneurship, what are your thoughts on stimulating growth from within in terms of empowering greater entrepreneurship within Hong Kong and then helping that those companies become public and like further grow and then transitioning from Hong Kong to China or the US instead of the other way around. Right. So, I mean, um, a few areas. Number one, Hong Kong has six of the top 100 universities in the world, which is pretty amazing. Talent is a critical component of developing, developing this innovation and this entrepreneurship. We have, I mean, I know a few here, um, you know, venture capitalists, private equity players, I mean, that will be very ready to support uh, with, with, with capital. So when we combine talent, creativity, with a favorable tax environment, uh, and, um, and an, an en encouraging infrastructure with things like, you know, whether it's a science park, I mean, or, or things like that, it, it, it will happen. And, and we're seeing now some significant unicorns out of, um, Hong Kong. Some of these were like in the news recently. I mean, it's like I mean, it's like really significant companies, creative, energetic, aggressive, and then you combine that with things like what I, we just talked about, Greater Bay Area. I mean, people are not talking sufficiently about the importance of this Greater Bay Area. I think it's going to be major and really, really positive for Hong Kong. A lot of people don't know this, but. Hong Kong has more university in the top 52 in the world than any other city in the world. More than Boston, more than anywhere else. Four among the, our eight are within the top 52. Uh, a question here in the middle, and then there's a student at the back. So after this gentleman, we'll go to the student. Thank you to both of you for all the stories and insights. Uh, with regards to the theme of ESG finance, uh, you touched upon it a little bit. You also mentioned about the big bang of finance. From your perspective and from your team at HKEX, how big a bang of ESG would be within that bigger bang? And would HKEX be that stock exchange of the world which will take all that non-financial disclosures and make it industry specific, decision useful so that more investors can compare the peers? And finally, uh, is, is, it, uh, is Hong Kong slower than Europe and US in ESG because we are still waiting for those PhDs to come here or is there something different you feel? So, um, first around, around the exchange and, 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 and the role that it can play, I, I, I believe that the exchange is positioned, uh, is well positioned to, to play a significant role. And I do believe that ESG is a real thing. It'll be very important going forward. So we will have to focus on it. Now, I've been there for six weeks, okay? <laughs> so, I, mean, like, uh, I, I, I just still need to work a, a little more in terms of understanding everything because I, I'm seeing all the things that they've done. And, and there's a lot, there's a lot of learning that I have around all the things that they've been you know, doing. And uh, they have like a web page called Stage where essentially they disclose everything that, 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 that there is around their issues and what everyone is doing, which is fabulous in terms of making sure that the people can go to one place and understand everything. That's more directed at investors that want to just know. But then there's opportunity of starting to use data and how do we really um, 
make sure that that it gets everyone to to where we want them to be whether it's in you know governance in diversity in climate and and so lots of opportunities it it'll take some time and whether hong kong is lower than 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 europe um I mean, I've, I've seen there was an announcement today about um, carbon trading to start in China. I think that in a matter of, you know, um, very few years, if, if that, I mean, China will be bigger than Europe in terms of carbon trading. And when we say China, a lot of that, I think it's going to be around the greater Bay Area. And as I mentioned, we do have an infrastructure, which is Hong Kong, but we also have um, the, um, uh, an in investment in the Guangzhou Futures Exchange, and, and we intend to play in, in, in some way, but, but that's still you know, being developed. You know, ESG is uh, really something that the West uh, has started, and for which I think we all should be thankful, and we learn from it. But on the other hand, China is the biggest emitter, uh, and I can make an easy argument that uh, the leadership in America, in China, is far more conscientious of this than ma than many presidents in the United States. So I think in the coming years, uh, if not decades, I think that China will really, really search ahead in this area, and I, I think ESG will be good for China and everyone else. Were well, some students at the back over there? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ronnie, and uh, good show. Oh, this is the Be leader of the students. Between, oh. between, <laughs> between myself and the students, we have one million and one questions, but we'll settle for two, if you allow. Sure. So um, I'm very fortunate to be um, an INDD to two biotech companies listed on Hong Kong. So um, to Ronnie's point about US and Chinese companies going to US, a lot of this first, second generation Chinese scientists who benefited from US education and who's been with the top pharmaceutical they are the ones who are listed as biotech companies on Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So I have a personal question for um, Gucho, if you allow, is we, I've seen in the past five years the uh, onset of Chapter 18A, the biotech companies, and initially it was a, a difficult struggle to persuade. So Charles really went to his personal circle. So we see his personal involvement and personal persuasion of his circle of friends to um, uh, return from... Uh, the, uh, from the US to China, and therefore, initially, we had very difficulty finding good biotech analysts. Uh, JP has a very uh, sophisticated uh, biotech uh, analyst in this area to support the biotech uh, HK. So it's a bit, big ecosystem. We can't find uh, suitable support. So they are all operated out of China, but capital markets in Hong Kong. So my personal question to you is, Charles has done this for Hong Kong. Great impact. What is your personal, your plate is full of initiatives and there's a lot to pick from. So what is your personal statement that you want to achieve for the next wave into Hong Kong? And I'll pass the mic to the student for her question. Good evening, my wait, name Wait, wait, wait. Uh, oh, shall sorry. we ask Kuchu to answer that one first? Right, right. <clears throat> so um, so I'm, I'm very thankful to, to the whole infrastructure that and contributions of Charles because he he did make um, my job now much better and, and much bigger and, and and it's great and I look now at what we have and we have like over 70 companies in the docket I mean healthcare companies now I, I bring different things and as it relates to China in, the, in uh, uh, specifically we have a board led by Laura Cha, who's, you know, very well plugged in into China. She was vice chairman of the CSRC. She was here in SFC. She's, you know, a very known um, talent in China who works very, very well with me. And we have a team, a Chinese team, that is also very, very active, which allows us to continue thriving and actually we're at record levels in terms of like new issues today. Now from my own uh, contribution, I do believe that around the world, I can provide a lot of like credibility, um, uh, consistency in, in terms of how Hong Kong presents itself to the world. And, and I, I, that's, that's what I intend to continue doing to make sure that we stay in in, 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 in the limelight for like a long time. 
you know, I've been marketing Hong Kong for the last 30 some years. I think that it's far more effective for somebody with Gucho's background to do that, especially in today's day and age, than somebody like me. The student over there, please. Uh, good evening. My name is Sita, and I actually study in Shanghai, the East China University of Political Science and Law. And I got really excited when you say uh, the big band of finance in the next 10 years will have China playing the main role. So my question is actually not as deep as the others, but do you think Hong Kong still have the potential to once again be the individual uh, financial capital in Asia, you know, independently, because like before we are not so reliant on China. I know we should be cooperative and connect with different places, as you have mentioned, but since Shanghai keeps saying that they already took over our significant place in the world, out of curiosity and competitive mind, do you think we can achieve this objectively with less help from China? Thank you. So <laughs> I, I will tell you, uh, uh, because it's important to look also at, at the data. Okay, very, very important always to go to the data. Because the way you, you position the question, it sounds like, okay, we're in a decline. Okay, so if I look specifically at the exchange, the volume traded in 2019 was around $87 billion per, per day average. Last year, that's 2019. 2020, 129. This year so far, almost 180. Already? On average. So, well, oh, it's, it's per average, day, average right. per yeah. day. So yeah. it's the daily traded volume. So it's almost like twice what it was, no, more than twice what it was in 2019. So you're growing at a rhythm of 50% per year. Now, I mentioned very specifically, I want Shanghai to do well. The better that Shanghai does, I will do better. What I want to make sure is that the pie gets bigger. I just don't care just about the, my piece of the pie. I care about making sure that the pie continues growing. And the, the, the more they grow, you know what? We're going to work together with them. We're going to make, make sure that investors continue seeing this as an attractive market. And most of those 180 billion per day that is traded, a lot of that, the majority of it, comes from international investors investing here. A lot of the volume today in Shanghai is obviously from domestic investors. As that starts moving and changing, they will do very well. They'll have more international investors. We'll have more domestic investors. And I think it'll be a win-win for everyone. Any other questions? The lady over there and then the gentleman. I'm going to let it go for a little bit, although it's already 7 o'clock. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. Hello, I'm Lydia from Ipsos. Um, actually, I have a very quick question. What's your visions for the growth enterprise exchange? I mean, um, because how do we become the NASDAQ of the future? Okay. So, um, this is one area that is trying to address the smaller companies. I, I actually don't think that GEMS is, is pretending to take the place of NASDAQ. I mean, it's, it's, it's a different market for much smaller companies that don't meet the criteria to go into the major market. I actually think that the main market is a competition to NASDAQ. And um, so I think that market will stay there, will, will cater to certain types, uh, types of companies. This is a market that requires a lot of uh, monitoring, a lot of discipline, because we want to make sure that investors can have the confidence that they invest in a company, whether it's in the main board or in GEMS, that it's a trustworthy investment. Okay, uh, the gentleman here in front. Yes. Uh, hello, Kai here. You mentioned about uh, growing the pie and you um, were talking at the level of exchanges. How do you view the future of competition between, let's say, mainland Chinese big brokers, securities companies, and the classic international banks. Um, and you know, given that at the beginning they needed to partner up together, now the market is a bit more open. Uh, and the question is, you know, will it become a zero sum game or will there be also opportunities for partnerships and other initiatives in the future? I, thank you. I think it's a very, very important question. And, and 
and I, I was um, an, I was an investment banker for like a long, long time. So this is something that I've looked um, for many years. And so, I mean, it, and it's, I'm going to shift it a little bit towards Hong Kong for a second because I, it's an important thing, especially with the news about like um, Biden warning, okay, companies in Hong Kong and, 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 and what that may do to some of the American banks, for example. I mean, a lot of the people that I know and I've been talking to a lot of them. So if you look at investment banking and wholesale banking, just that area, excluding retail, okay? Put aside retail, just wholesale banking. The top five banks in the world, they're all American. It's JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Citigroup, Bank of America. I mean, they're American. Not because Americans have a gene for investment banking that is better than anyone else in the world, but because that was the biggest capital market in the world and allowed them to leverage that home position to do really well across the world. And that's why it was so hard for the European banks to succeed in the US and for the European banks even to succeed here. It's, it's very, very challenging. They have a stronghold. So it is very important when you're in wholesale banking, in investment banking, to be global and to be big and sizable. Now, I, I do believe that players that play in this market have an opportunity to be global leaders in the future, whether they are Chinese, whether they are European, American, everyone. So anyone that does not participate in this market is going to be severely handicapped in the future. Anyone that doesn't play in this market with what I mentioned, it's about to happen over the next 10 years. So it's very, very important to make sure that that position stays. And, and, and some will do it through partnerships. They will partner with like um, domestic Chinese brokers. I mean, they're really, really good using tech and developing efficient systems. And so I, I do think that they will succeed, uh, whether it's through partnerships or standalone. One or two more over there. She's the, the lady there. Yeah, she's from USC. Must be good. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie the Chen, former alum of USC Marshall School of Business. So my question is touch on digital asset a little bit. Um, and I, saw, I also know that Hong Kong Stock Exchange has done so well for a lot of shareholders. But there's a lot of cryptocurrency exchanges in the world. And I know that you're still quite, you know, two months into the job. Maybe you have not given much thought yet. So I was just kind of curious what direction you would take Hong Kong Stock Exchange in the digital asset space. Thank you. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that, um, as I mentioned, is something that we should all track keep looking at, there's a lot of um, areas that you need to analyze, including the legality of a certain activities in certain places. Um, but I do believe that we have a lot to learn from uh, some of these crypto exchanges in terms of how they do things, their flexibility, their ability to, to uh, handle tremendous volume. It's r really impressive. So. It's not in, in the week two type of things that I'm analyzing right now, but it's something that I, I definitely keep, you know, in, in my bucket list, in my to-do list, and, and I want to analyze it. And, um, and, and it's certainly something that at a minimum we learn a lot from and see how we can use it um, to, to, to apply certain parts that may be interesting for us. We are waiting and we are watching yeah, the gentleman and Hi, then the lady here. in front later. Yep, two, two questions, but one question you might not want to answer, so just, I give you a choice. Um, so SPACs in the US, um, there were over 300 SPACs listed this year so far and has been the preferred vehicle for most listing. Now, I know HAEX is now doing consultation at SPACs. What do you think the SPACs market will do to Hong Kong and the financial ecosystem in Hong Kong? So that's the first question. The other choice is, um, you mentioned Southeast Asia as one of the market besides China that the HEX is looking at. So what do you think the market opportunity is it for HEX? And what are some of the concrete steps the exchange is actually doing to attract companies to listen in Hong Kong? Thank you. 
Okay, on, on, on the first one, I, I do think that uh, SPACs is something worth analyzing. And it's been public that um, we've been discussing with the SFC and um, with with the government about um, what role can SPACs play in in, in Hong Kong. Um, and what I'll say is that we want to make sure that when we introduce a product in Hong Kong, it's not a product that um, that is subject to risks of, for example, in the US, you'll have some SPACs by an influencer. Just, be, just because it's an influencer, uh, um, you know, it doesn't mean that they have the qualifications to manage a SPAC. We, not, we want to make sure that it's a quality SPAC. We will always prioritize, prioritize quality over quantity. So my view, we're not going to have a market of 300 SPACs in one quarter, okay? <laughs> Um, uh, but uh, it's something, in my view, worth exploring. The lady in the front, last question. Sorry, the, the second question. Oh, sorry, I, I sorry. Missed. What was the second one? I mean, I don't know. Southeast Asia, how do Southeast we... Asia. Yeah. Well, the best thing that we can do is make sure we have a vibrant companies, comp uh, uh, vibrant companies in, in, in the market that others can say, oh, that's a great comparable to me. The best is that we can attract investors from all over the world that want to invest here. People, I mean, when banks invest, in investment companies, asset managers, they don't want to have 25 centers around the world. It's too costly for them. They prefer to trade to a single you know, venue. So if we can gain critical mass, that's very important. So one of the things that I want to make sure I focus on is on increasing our velocity. Our velocity is just like the amount traded relative to market cap. So we need to do more in there. And, um, and, and by doing that, and of course having like a sales force, you have to go have people you know, go out there and talk to clients and things like that, but, but that will attract companies from any place in the world. Last question, the lady in the middle. Thank you. Um, if I have a question about your um, about biotech and about the fact that you mentioned that Hong Kong is currently the second hub, like the biggest hub, the second biggest hub globally. Yeah. If the what the initiative that mentioned earlier in the student sort of dealt with the like issue of the fact that most biotech companies are pre-revenue, um, what is the next sort of step to sort of on that road to gaining the number one position. Yeah. So um, uh, about half of the issuers are um, pre-revenue. So there's been about 70 healthcare companies that listed in the last three years. Half of the issuers, but it's only 80 billion out of 400 billion. So, I mean, it's, it, it's depending half the issuers, but a lot less in terms of the capital raise because a lot of these companies are a little smaller and, and, and therefore less, less volume overall. The key challenge is that a lot of those are just from the mainland. What I would love to see is more being done in terms of like companies that are actually based in Hong Kong and leveraging intellectual resources from Hong Kong. And, and that requires a whole lot of things and a lot of things that are being worked on, like making sure that you have the right promotions, you have the right talent, um, you have the right you know, infrastructure. And, 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 and that takes time. But, but it feeds on itself. The more we continue growing, the more that we're going to have. And what I think that we need to be able to, to make sure that uh, we get to that next stage that we're, we're number one, first of all, we need to do whatever we can to be efficient and reduce cost. Today, if you're an investor, it's very easy to take a, well, not super easy, but you can get a stake in an IPO. But then when you want to exit, you may not because there's no liquidity. A lot of these companies are kind of smaller. So we need to make sure that there is liquidity. Something that people don't focus too much is the fact that some of these players that just add liquidity, whether it's a high frequency trader, it's like an investment banker, where there is whatever it is, it adds to the market. Because then whenever you want to exit, you can exit. And that makes sure that, you know, that investors from France decides, oh, I'll go there because I can put $2 million, I can get in there and then I can get out. 
If you can get in, but then when you want to get out, you can't. It's a problem. So liquidity is super important. That's why I said one of the things that I want to focus on is I want to focus on velocity. This is very important. And this I have to work with a lot of stakeholders to make sure that we all agree that this is important. And then, we, I mean, it's making sure that we make the infrastructure as efficient as possible. And when people come here, they can trade cheaply. Well, good job. You know, my family invests a lot in uh, biotech. Many people know that. Oh. And um, we used to go to the JP Morgan yeah. conference all the time in San Francisco. And, um, you know, the Taiwan tried to do a biotech uh, board. Uh, and because of the first couple of deals being really bad deals and it really ruined the place. We were thinking of listing some of our companies there. We stayed away. And I think that Hong Kong has already get over that hump that we are okay, 80 companies, right? So, so we are already over that hump. Uh, as long as we don't do really, really stupid things, I think we should be really well on our way to succeed in this regard. Well, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, we all know that the financial market is so important to Hong Kong, uh, and, uh, and Hong Kong exchange is extraordinarily critical to the future success of Hong Kong's economy uh, and as a society. So I think that we can, after today, feel a little bit more uh, relaxed, knowing that the Hong Kong exchange is under good hands, leadership, smart people, good people, and I think Hong Kong future should have been strengthened a little bit more because of today's program mm -hmm. of the Asia Society, but with Gucho Agusen. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.